Okay, so here we are with yet another episode of Crowd Content Labs, um, or CC Labs for short. So, you know, this is uh, now becoming a favorite of mine, and I love doing this, just kind of chatting about what's going on in the industry of SEO and content marketing. Um, how are you doing today, Rick? I'm doing great, Carlos. Thanks. Feels like we just left. And here we are <laughs> for another week, right? Exactly. So um, we'll keep this. Uh, we'll keep doing this. Uh, we're getting some some solid feedback and gr uh, good good analytics on on open rates and whatnot. So we'll keep we'll keep doing them because uh, apparently people like them. So anyway, um, so today what do we have on a store? One, we uh, we're going to talk about clarification on how the algorithm chooses um, feature snippets. So there there was some clarification. From Google last week, so we'll talk about that. Also, um, Danny Sullivan comments around what it is a perfect page and kind of debunking some myths around that. We'll talk about how to keep or how to develop and maintain consistency in your brand voice. Then, um, Rick will give us great tips and uh, how to edit for non editors, editing for non editors. And last but not least, um, a thought leader in the SEO and digital marketing industry came out with very interesting findings around the performance of AI generated content and human generated content. So you're going to have to stay tuned and listen towards the end to get um, to get those those findings. So anyway, well, let's let's get into it. Feature snippets. How do you think, Rick, that uh, Google chooses feature snippets? What's your thinking? Well, I, I already know the answer, Carlos, because you, you told me. Um, but had you asked me before then, I'd have given you the same spiel as, as, as anything else in that you need outstanding content. Uh, but generally, when, when we're advising clients on how to optimize for featured snippets, it's about forming your, your subheads in, in question format and making sure you directly and thoroughly answer that question in the very first paragraph, as close to the beginning of that paragraph as possible, save the elaboration for the further paragraphs. But apparently there's a misconception out there, and, and I think you're going to tell us about that. Absolutely. So um, Google came out and, and changed the wording in um, around feature snippets. They upgraded because they realized that the wording was misleading. So you could imply from the previous wording that meta descriptions and structured data were important to gain a feature snippet, but it's not. And you you were closer to the truth than you, than, um, than, than you think. So it, it is about the content on page. So if the content is good, it's answered the question, that's how really Google snippet gets picked. But Given Google's own guidance, um, it was misleading. So people or SEOs were optimizing the meta descriptions and um, the structured data to try to get a, uh, gain a feature snippet. Um, so no need to optimize the meta description for feature snippet. You should optimize meta description. And I think something interesting in the, in the wording is that you should treat the meta description as a pitch to the reader to, to why they should care and stay and, and read the piece. So I think it's a very important distinction. Again, SEOs out there that are trying to optimize meta descriptions for feature snippets, that's not the way to go. It's just creating the, the, the right type of content. So because Google is picking the content from the from the from the page. So I think you were you were somewhat right, Rick, and in the right track, which you know is kind of obvious, but I think Google's uh, verbiage or worrying was a little bit misguided, so or misleading. So now we know. And they came out and clarified that. So that was great. So uh, that leads me into, you know, in the in the Google, to keep in the Google train. So Danny Sullivan came out um, and clarified or, or debunked the myth of there is a, a perfect page, quote unquote. <laughs> and what is a perfect page? And there's not such a thing as a perfect page. And I think, again, SEOs fall into the trap of trying to um, optimize based on what they see in the SERP and trying to, okay, maybe if we have these many words and we have these many uh, H1s, uh, oh, of course, well, these many H2s, H3s, and if we have these, these like this recipe, we're going to rank. And there's no such a thing. And the funny thing is Danny pointed in, this was through Twitter or X, 
um, he pointed to uh, an article that he had written back in 2000, pretty much saying the same. Like, there's not a perfect page. It's just about, you know, uh, information for the reader and, and, and giving a clear answer. So he also mentioned all these SEO tools that are out there that give you, um, let's say, kind of, recipe style recommendations uh, when you're creating content. And yeah, so you, you need to treat those with a grain of salt because again, there is no such a thing as a perfect page. And Google is not looking at, does your page have this, <laughs> this, this, this workout to make it rank? Um, so um, I think it's, it's interesting and a good reminder for, for content creators, content marketers and SEOs out there that you know, to stop chasing the perfect page just chase, chase the best content that you can create for your readers. What do you think of that, Rick? I think it, it always amuses me that people are looking for that magic formula, right? There, there's a secret key to, to the mystery of ranking, and and, and it's, it's right there staring in you in the face. Google has made no secret of this. Create good content for your audience in your industry, in your niche. Do it often. And, and that's it. That's it. There, of course, I, I don't want to, you know, belittle the value of SEO, especially technical SEO. There are absolutely some boxes that have to be checked, but there is no magic formula. You know, check those boxes, create excellent content. That is the best you can do. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, just yet another reminder. And we're going to sound like a broken record. We're going to come up with some reminder every week that you have to create great content. Create good content. No, no secret. <laughs> yeah, no secret recipe here. All right. Uh, let's talk about brand, voice, and tone. One of our favorite subjects. And, you know, we always like to bring tips, a strategic or technical or tactical in how to create better content. And, of course, brand, voice, and tone is a big one to create great content. And Rick, you're going to walk us through how to develop consistency and how to maintain that. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think this is an today. important topic, Carlos, because I mean, we've talked to clients recently and we had a we had guessed that this might be near the top of the list of pain points um, that some of our clients were experiencing uh, when they tried to produce content on their own uh, or through other provider, other means. And, and that is how do you get consistent brand voice, especially at scale when you're working with any number of writers and potentially editors and, and then a further level of review? Um, you know, it's a problem for people. And, and I can see it in briefs that we get and resources that we get from clients. Uh, it's not that they're not addressing brand voice. It's that they're not addressing it correctly or in enough depth. So I wanted to take a minute here and just give, give a few tips to help those of you who are, are running content projects for your businesses uh, and you're struggling to get a consistent voice from, from your writers. First, uh, and just like good content, there's no magic formula here. You've got to put the work in. But first is clear guidelines. Um, and most businesses do take a stab at that, but what... What they end up with are some some words that are vague, um, that maybe don't really get that voice into the head of the writer. Uh, so you've got to go into some detail here, and don't be afraid to include a list of things we love. You know, it could be words, it could be phrases, uh, and things we don't like at all. Again, words or phrases. Um, give your 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 voice consider it like a personality. You know, give it a face and a name. Pick someone. I always have fun with this. Pick a historical figure, pick a fictional character, pick a well-known celebrity, you know, that, that embodies the voice that, that your business is going for. Um, I found AI to be useful in helping to land on somebody that's known enough that, that it'll mean something. But when those writers see that, rather than reading about your voice and trying to understand it, now they can hear it in their heads. When you're giving them the name of someone who 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 has that voice that you're going for, it's in their heads now, and they'll find that a lot more useful. Um, you know, Steve Jobs is a good one. Steve Harvey. I mean, think about that. I could use words. Well, like let's say 
you know, you're witty. We're humorous. You know, and you go with Steve Harvey and Steve Martin. They're both humorous. They're both witty, but in two entirely different ways. Right. So just telling your writers that our voice is witty and humorous. We're funny. Uh, that's not enough. It could go in so many different ways. Is that silly puns? Is it dry wit? Um, so a name, a face, a personality, let them hear the voice in their heads. That'll really help dial them in on your voice. Uh, give them plenty of examples. And for two, two reasons here, as you get into the minutia of your voice, um, small snippet examples really are helpful to show this is when we're showing this in our voice. You know, just a couple few sentences. Um, but that's not enough. What you need are full length examples uh, at the end of your brief as an attachment, whatever it may be. And the reason for this, Carlos, is I've described voice and tone in the past as kind of like dials on a stereo, right? Where like your voice is actually the music coming from your stereo. It doesn't change that it is what it is. But if you dial, you know, the, the, the tone, uh, I'm sorry, the treble or the, the bass, it changes how that sounds. There's another dial you have to be concerned with, and that's volume. I could say that I like salt on my pasta, but if you dump the whole shaker on, it's going to be awful. And what yeah. doesn't come across in voice descriptions a lot is the volume. How much of that voice should be? If we are funny and witty, uh, are we funny and witty every sentence? You know, a full length article or two that showcase how that seasoning is sprinkled on, whether it's heavy or light or evenly dispersed. Uh, you know, what the volume of that voice is will help get the writer aligned. Um, and that's not something we see enough of. So good to have that full length piece to, to showcase the use of the voice, but also the frequency of that voice, particularly for unique voices. Now, once you have all that done and put together and shared out with your writers, what's really critical if you're trying to get aligned because you've been having voice problems or you're bringing in a new writer is feedback really 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 heavy at first always every article should have feedback on voice when you're trying to get aligned with the writer and it's not just critical you've got to point out where it's off of course but keep in mind that your writers don't fully know when they're right either and if you're not pointing out the sections of an article that they nailed it they they don't know that they did it so you have to go both ways. The critical feedback needs to be there to show them where they went wrong. And you have to point out what they got right so they can do more of that. Um, finally, uh, well, not finally, two more quick things. One is always have one source of truth. The more scaled your project is, the more important this becomes. Um, you know, a, a small to medium writer pool with, say, one editor. Pretty easy. You can even make that editor the source of truth. Everything funnels through them. They should be your brand voice expert. But the larger a project becomes, lots of writers, multiple editors. Now you have to make sure your editors are aligned. There should be a third level of review that everything is funneled through from a voice standpoint alone. Uh, of course, count on your editors to, to do all of your tangible requirements and such. But for voice, make sure there is one source of truth. One person you say, yeah, that is on or that's not, we should go somewhere here. Uh, and last but not least, be good to your freelancers. Writers who can hit your brand voice are hard to come by, whether they're in-house or they're freelancers. It, it, they're not plug and play. You know, it can take a long time to get a writer really aligned with your, with your brand's voice, uh, with the right tone. Um, and if you lose them and you have to replace them, you could go through half a dozen writers or more before you find somebody yeah. again, and then you've got to go through that whole learning curve again. So be good to them. They're hard to, to find. The good ones really are diamonds in the rough, Carlos. Yeah. And so here's another tip that um, this, for for instance, for social media or thought leadership, um, when, you know, is more under, the, the, the content is more under a person, but you, um, you don't know yet what your voice is, um, but you, you can, uh, find inspiration in others. So <clears throat> one of the things that we ask clients that when they want to create social media content, especially for instance, LinkedIn, we ask them, okay, send me samples of two or three people that you follow that you really, really like the content that are produced. 
and that helps us with inspiration. And maybe um, we can capture the voice, or at least from those from that inspiration, with the with the feedback from the client, uh, we can make a blend and come out with a voice. Uh, so it's always good to have um, inspiration examples because sometimes it's hard to describe. Yeah, I don't know what my voice is, right? And and mo- a lot of people, especially in business, they they want to be formal but but casual, but that doesn't make any sense. Formal but casual doesn't mean any- <laughs> that doesn't mean anything, right? Like uh, so. It's good to have these examples. I, I love your your idea of using uh, kind of actors, right, um, or or personalities, celebrities, because that 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 is a good way. Like Morgan Freeman, right? Uh, do you want to sound Morgan like Freeman. Morgan Freeman? Uh, um, I don't know. Do you want to be uh, Al Pacino or a Robert De Niro or Steve Martin? I think great examples. But anyway, let's. Um, I can't say let's I've, not I've talk heard about- Al Pacino as as a as a brand voice. It'd be an interesting one, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Let me introduce Maybe. you to my little friend. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Maybe if you're if you're in the in the tow truck industry, maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe some of those uh, more um, you know uh, home service kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, so that's uh, that good 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 tips there, uh, Rick. So let's talk now about content strategy and. We come across this a lot, and we see it in many companies and many clients where they just want to go and they just want to produce content. But when we you ask them, why, <laughs> why do you want to do this? What are you trying to achieve? And um, why do you want to do this this way? Uh, they don't have a good answer. So, and this is something where I think what is missing is, is having really a clear strategy. A lot of people come and say, I want to create blogs. Why do you create, want to create blogs? Oh, because my competitors are doing it. And why do you think your competitors are doing it? And then as you ask, like, you know, like a three-year-old and you ask why, 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 then the, 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 the things get really tricky. And it is why people don't have, uh, that's why I want to talk about content strategy. And I think it's a very important thing to think about content strategy before putting literally li- literal pen to paper or before start typing on the keyboard, right? Um, well before. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes clients say, I want to create all these blocks and I and I, I have to send them back to the drawing board and say, look, as much as I would like to take your business, I can't because in, in, in the right, in, in, in our right mind, we can, we know that you're not going to get results because you don't have a strategy yet, right? Or maybe your strategy is not sound. So really is the most important thing when you're before creating, a, creating content is having a clear strategy. Why are you creating content and what what is the, the, the result or what is the goal that you're trying to expect? And within a content strategy, there are many things that need to happen. So one, what is your messaging, right? Uh, what is that you're trying to convey? Two, what is your brand voice tone, as we were just talking about, right? Like you need to define that. Also, who is your target audience? What are the personas that you're writing for? Um, and also the channels. And, and here, this is very important because some people see SEO as a strategy, but SEO is really a channel, right? It's a way to reach your audience or to reach um, a potential audience is through search engines, right? And so it's not, it's just a tactic or a channel or a tool. So you cannot have, uh, uh, you shouldn't have an SEO plan without having a content strategy first. So content strategy is not a result of SEO. Is all the way around. SEO is, is a result of your content strategy. And for some people, SEO might not be the best place, right? It's not, um, uh, depend on the business, right? There might be some exceptions where um, I've seen businesses where most of their their um, clients come from referrals. And it's the type of business that really grows on the, ba- the, on the back of referrals, meaning that SEO is probably not the best channel to use. But just, just have to say, like, um, when, you, when you're uh, looking at your content strategy, you need to develop the fundamentals. Okay, what are the goals? Are we trying to achieve? Who are we trying to, to, to reach? What is our brand voice and tone? Uh, what are the different things that we want to say? Uh, what are the different stages of the funnel? And what is the messaging for the different stages of the funnel? What is the buyer's journey? Uh, and then you can think about what are the distribution channels? Is it the search engines? Is it uh, social media? Is it a newsletter, right? Um, so all these things are very important in a content strategy. So anyway, I just want to remind everybody that content strategy is really the first step before starting to produce content. And it's very important that you have a sound strategy. Otherwise, 
your content efforts might not be as fruitful if you don't do the pre-work of having a sound content strategy. So, uh, and a rant on the content strategy. Now, let's talk about editing for non-editors. Um, you know, we talked about editing a lot, and I think we talked about editing last episode, but we're we're going to talk about editing for non-editors, which is I think is important. Not everybody has access to an editor, and of course, uh, professional editors are um, very scarce resource. So if you don't have access to one, uh, maybe you can do the editing yourself. So Rick, please um, give us some tips around that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody in, in content marketing who hasn't at some point been faced with having to edit an article and they're not quite sure what to do. Um, and I, I, I felt this was an important topic to talk, uh, talk about because I think most end up going in the exact opposite direction from where they should. Um, and that is to start with proofreading. You know, editing is so much more, especially when it comes to content editing. It is so much more than a proofread and proofreading first will do nothing but lead you down a, a road of mistakes and possibly bad content. So for those of you who do find yourselves having to edit from time to time, and maybe you don't come from an editing background, what should you do first? Here it is. The first step should be to review the content brief. Don't even look at what the writer has written. Go to the content brief, review the SEO, review the reader engagement strategy, review the business objective for the piece, review the outline so that you're familiar or you, you, you have a feeling for what the journey that this content should take you on. You need to be aligned on those things before you even lay eyes on the content. Once you do grab the content, read it. Just read it. Don't pay attention to commas. Don't pay attention to grammar, to syntax, to, you know, is that H2 in title case or no? Ignore all that. Read it like you're the reader. Is the message on point? Is it logical? Does it flow well? Um, is the journey what you expected? You reviewed the outline. So is the writer taking you on the journey you expected based on the outline and the content brief? Are, are you seeing any insights? Are you getting any value from it? Is this a good, solid piece of content? Does it follow EEAT principles? Uh, is it engaging? Answer all those questions. And, and if it's not, stop. Send it back to your writer with notes to revise. Uh, it's okay to skip ahead to part two here before you send it back to the writer if you want to, because part two is okay, but not three. Um, so if those things aren't in line, send it back. Now move on. If it either comes back from, you know, with the revisions, or if you want to do this step before you send it back, you can too. But the next step is to go through it for requirements, right? So you're not reading it. Now you're looking at the brief, you know, what, what would, what's the writer supposed to do as far as linking goes, as far as SEO, uh, maybe keyword usage, um, but any tangible requirements that the writer was given to follow, here's where you check the boxes. Go through it all. Is it all there? Once you're done with that, now you should have an article that's good, it's valuable, it's logical, it flows well, um, it accounts for SEO, all the formatting's aligned, the voice is on target, uh, all of that is good. Finally, now you can get to what's called a line edit, but you're, where you're reading it word by word. And the reason you don't want to do that step first, Carlos, is it's like a can't see the forest for the trees thing. You are going to miss the message entirely if you are reading line by line, word by word, looking at commas, looking at syntax, looking at punctuation and grammar. Uh, if, if you do that, you will miss all of it. <laughs> there, there may not be any logic here whatsoever, and it's really easy to miss it. So the very last thing is that proofread. Go through it, make the sentences tighter, you know, more concise, get rid of the fluff, um, check your grammar things of that nature. And this is also a really good spot to fact check. Uh, if there are statistics in there, go ahead and check the links to make sure it's it's all good. Uh, if you follow that process, you should be okay. And you should save, you know, it's really a more efficient process uh, so that you're not, you know, tightening up wording that's ultimately going to be deleted when you realize you don't need that paragraph to begin with. So that's it. 
Yeah, no, actually pretty insightful, Rick. Uh, and you gave us a, a pretty uh, straightforward system. So start with the with the high level, right? Make sure the message is on point. And then the last part is getting to the nitty gritty because you start with the nitty gritty and the little details, and you're gonna miss um, you're gonna miss the message. And like you say, you're gonna miss the forest for the trees. So I think this is pretty insightful, and hopefully uh, our audience finds it helpful um, when when they're editing. Okay, so last but not least, so whether you I know the, he he is a controversial figure. He has like a lot of followers, but there's also full of, <laughs> I know there's lots of detractors in an industry. Our friend Neil Patel, he came out um, with some statistics around the effectiveness of AI generated content and human generated content. So here's a few tidbits um, that I thought were interesting. And I think they surveyed a thousand over a thousand businesses and they found, they asked him, okay, how, how much are you using um, AI to generate content? And they found that 12.3% are not using AI. So, which means that 88% of businesses were using AI to generate content, whether it was full, full AI or a hybrid of AI and humans. So I thought, you know, interesting, not surprising, right? Now everybody's using AI, we've been talking about it um, ad nauseum for the last 18 months. So uh, not surprising. I think really what is very interesting is the performance. And what uh, they found is that 94% of the, of the content that performs, of that ranks well, is fully human written. So it's a huge asymmetry, a, a, a symmetry here of the results. So like very little AI generated content is ranking. And they also did a run an experiment and they realized that an AI generated post generated around 52 um, clicks, whereas uh, fully human written post would generate 200 and something. So uh, a factor of 5x the performance. So the conclusion was human generated content is going to win the day. Now, here's our take. My take. I think it's more nuanced than that. I don't think it's as simple as humans versus machines. So this is because, Reg, you know well, we have come across some very subpar writers that, you know, just for the fact that it was a, a, a human writer writing the post um, or writing the piece doesn't mean it's going to rank because it's still a bad writer or a below average writer. So it's not so simple about, oh, then my post has to be human. I think it's easier to, conf to get confused by that. I, and I think it's more, again, I keep... Saying this every time I can, and for anybody that would listen, it's not about whether it's written by, by AI or a human. It's about how good the post is and how good the information and is there information gain and so on and so forth. Anyway, I thought it was a very interesting post. I think I started to feel that the shine is slowly coming off the whole AI thing. And I think uh, like all new technologies, there is this cycle where there's a lot of hype. And then, you know, a lot of people lose interest and realize it's not what we thought. And kind of it normalizes and the use cases kind of stabilize. I think we're starting to enter that phase where the hype is behind. Now, you know, shine is coming off and the, the, the use cases are, are, are stabilizing. See lots of use cases in the pre, in the, in the, in the pre stage or in the pre composition stage and in the post composition stage. I think those are really here to stay. Uh, but the composition is kind of, again, it's, I think it's losing its shine and, and people are starting to realize that it's, it's not creating the quality that people want. And if you want to create quality, you ended up you end up spending up the same amount of effort or more. So yeah, just my take. Uh, interesting, inter interesting post uh, from Neil. Um, Rick, what do you think? I was a little surprised by the numbers, to be honest with you. Um, uh, Eighty-eight uh, percent seemed high to me. Um, and I think that there's some really outstanding human AI hybrid content out there. Uh, but I'd be curious to look at a little more of the details. And I don't know if the shine is behind us, Carlos. I think we might be in a lull. I can't wait until, you know, GPT-5 drops. And I, I think you'll see all of the hype coming right back, uh, depending on, you know, what that model ends up being capable of. But it could be an interesting year. But I, I think you made a good point that, We've kind of uh, romanticized the value of human writing. There's plenty of garbage human writing out there. It's kind of like where, you know, one thing you hear from everybody when talking about AI is, well, it can make stuff up. 
it could be incorrect. It's yeah. factually incorrect, right? Like, like we haven't had factually incorrect human written content as a major problem for years and years and years. Like they still get it wrong. This is why we have editors in QA to fact check and, and, and go through things, right? It's, we all make mistakes. So AI does too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I don't, know. I, I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't recommend AI written content fully, but human yeah, no, and AI not. hybrid, there could be a winner. Yeah, but um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I love to see people online and, oh, I posted all these AI generated content and it ranked very well. But then, okay, well, show me, show me 16 months, show me 18 months of track record. Because, yeah, maybe you can, but um, usually catch, it, 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 it catches up to you. Um, so I think like anything in life, nothing that comes easy. Um, will be sustainable. So, and if it is easy, everybody can do it. So again, if anything, I think um, content ranking is going to get a little bit harder. So there's going to be much more competition. Uh, we have seen a huge clamp down on, on, on subpar content from the helpful content update, update. Even good content, like I've seen good content getting like totally destroyed just because People are, other people are creating better content and that's as simple as that. And even the like user experience, um, maybe you have two pieces of content, but one has better user that are similar and one has better user experience than the other and the better user experience is going to, is going to rank better. So, um, it's, it's getting, it's becoming harder and harder to, to, to really rank. But, uh, anyway, so we leave it out there with, uh, with our audience to, um, make their own conclusions, but. Okay, that's it for today. Another fun episode, Rick. Um, I feel like I could stay here uh, hours and hours just geeking out around content, but uh, we need to let our audience move on with their life and to all, other more fun things. But thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, we will be having a few interesting webinars coming on. And we have also, uh, you can always go to our bank of webinars. We have had amazing people in, in, in our stage. Um, Lily Ray a couple times, uh, Brittany Mueller, um, and we are coming with um, all, all other amazing webinars in the near future. So stay tuned and uh, thanks for listening. Bye, Rick, and bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.